Well, thank you for joining us in today's podcast. I have with me Dr. Halazan, who will be discussing his paper entitled, Standing the Test of Time, Outcomes of a Decade of Prioritizing Patients with Hepatocellular Carcinoma, Results from the UNOS Natural Geographic Experiment. This paper will be out in the December issue of Hepatology. And I'd like to welcome you today to today's podcast. Thank you. You know, your, your, uh, your research is, is important because for several years now, we've been allocating liver cancer to meld exception points and artificially bringing them to transplantation sooner than a patient who didn't have liver cancer but had decompensated disease. And I think your paper sheds quite a bit of light on, on what this really means, puts it in perspective, should we be doing this moving forward? Tell us a little bit about what got you uh, started on this trial. So first of all, thanks for having me. Um, essentially, having trained in New York and living in New York, we looked at the HCC patients with exceptions and saw that the patients who were the HCC were getting transplanted at pretty much the same MELs as the non-HCC patient. And when you look across the country, patients in other regions were getting transplanted much faster with HCC, given that they're prioritized on the list and the waiting times are much shorter. So essentially, it was a great setup for essentially a population-based study to, to check out what's going on with the patients that we're expediting versus the patients who actually aren't getting that expedited by the MELD exception points. So what we did is we compared regions five and nine to regions three and 10, um, five and nine being the long waiting time regions and three and mm -hmm. 10 being the short waiting time regions. And there were significant differences in the waiting times, about six months difference in the waiting time um, for the, on the median waiting time for the two regions. And um, interestingly, we found significant differences in survival in, on both an intent to treat and uh, uh, analysis and post-transplant survival. Um, uh, and there's about an 8% difference in survival being favoring patients who waited longer. So um, and it was an interesting finding uh, to, to note that essentially uh, time might be the best surrogate for tumor biology rather than the imaging right. that we use right now. So, so how do you... What are some takeaways from this study? What, what, should, what do you want to convey to your audience as far as the results of the study, kind of putting it in perspective? Should we, be, should we continue to do, I mean, your title is Standing the Test of Time. Should we continue to allocate as we do now? Should we, there's work afoot of maybe changing the, uh, the MELD exception point criteria. Um, tell me a little bit about that. So I think the, the, you, you, you're coming to a great point, which is I think UNOS is really thinking about putting a six-month six mandatory waiting time for patients. And I think the main takeaway from the study is, is don't rush to transplant patients with HCC as soon as they get listed with MELZ of 22 if you, if you are in a region that can transplant patients with, with MELZ of 22. So nobody knows what the impact of SHARE 35 is going to be on, on HCC allocation and whether SHARE 35 in and of itself is going to uh, make a balance for, for waiting times. Um, what's true, though, is that you can't rush to transplant HCCs if you're able to transplant them at very low amounts, and I think that's the main takeaway from the study. Clearly, there's no uniformity in how we treat the patients among different centers in terms of pre-transplant um, chemobilization, et cetera, so more uniformity would also be good, um, and that's one of the other takeaway points in the study is that we can't really s uh, assess intracenter uh, variability for these patients, and which could account for some of the differences that we're seeing. So, uh, any limitations that you noticed from a study like this? Sure. I mean, we, we analyzed registry data, which in and of itself is problematic. We didn't really have recurrence data, um, or, well, we didn't have recurrence data, point blank. Um, so, it's very hard to tell why the patients were essentially dying on the list or dying afterwards, but, you know, one can infer that they're dying from tumor. Um, if you look at the difference between the um, intent to treat survival and the overall uh, survival just for the transplant patients, you'll see that the difference in the first year actually is increased when you take the waitlist dropouts out. So that means that you're probably ma unmasking bad tumor biology in the short waiting time. Other limitations are, um, are uh, as I mentioned, you know, you, we, can't, we don't know what the, the specific center behaviors are for when they list their patients, when they decide to chemoembolize their patients whether they accept T3 tumors or not in short waiting time regions. And those are major limitations that, you know, will, uh, it's begging for more uniformity among, among uh, the treatment of this disease. So Dr. Halazan, what can we expect next from you and your team? Sure, I think one of the things that you can expect is we need to analyze, or, or we're working on analyzing what's going on with the tumors with SHARE35. 
Again, it's analyzing registry data, so it's not really uh, that great, but it's, it's still, uh, it still provides food for thought in terms of how to treat the patients. The other interesting thing that's going on now in the last two years is that UNIS has been collecting pathology data. So uh, we're looking to analyze that at when, when the results are available. So when we combine the waiting time data, the pathology data, and the SHARE35 data, we may have different answers than we do right now. And, and we may even have different questions that we need to ask with the gut stream. So just follow up on the pathology data. Are you looking at gene expression profiles to help identify tumor biology and maybe linking that to prognosis and how long patients can wait? Well, we are in our own institution at Emory. We're, we're, look, we're trying to identify those patients right now and look, trying to genetically profile those patients to see whether there's specific gene expression that we can pick up early on peri perif in peripheral blood when we compare it to tumor. Um, we haven't gotten far yet, but we're, uh, one of the struggles is that most of the genetic profiling that's available is on hepatitis B patients from Asia. And I think we have a different cohort of patients here with hepatitis C patients who are, uh, you know, genetically variable among the different ethnicities that we have in, in the country too. So I don't know that we're looking at the same tumors in everybody, but we're attempting to, to do that. Sure, sure. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Halazan today for his time in describing this uh, incredible study that's going to be out in the December issue of Hepatology. We look forward to more future innovative uh, studies from his group moving forward. Thank you very much.